Okay, uh, thank you. This is again the House Healthcare Committee. It's uh, Monday, March 9th, and it's now about 3.25 p.m. after taking a break. After hearing testimony from the Commissioner and the Deputy Commissioner of the Vermont Department of Mental Health, we now have uh, four, four different witnesses, excuse me, who I intend to hear from in the next hour. And uh, I'm going, as I mentioned earlier, uh, requesting that Devin Green and uh, uh, her testimony be rescheduled uh, to a later time in order to ensure that we have time to hear from these witnesses. I've also uh, contacted the commissioner and deputy commissioner and they are going to stay throughout this te testimony, which I think is important and useful for them both to hear the testimony and possibly uh, if there are questions that would be directed by committee members, not witnesses to them. So with that, uh, let's turn to our first witness because I know they have a time, particular time constraint, and that's uh, Kath Kathleen Lamphere, who works at uh, Health Care and Rehabilitation Services uh, in southeastern Vermont. So welcome, and I'm going to turn it over to you. And we're asking if you can keep your presentation to 10, 15 minutes at the outside so we can hear from everyone involved. But we're happy to have Absolutely. you. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Somebody will tell me if you can't. Um, my name is Kate Lampfear and I am the Director of Adult Services at HCRS, which is one of, the, one of Vermont's designated agencies to provide mental health services in the state. I'm also representing Vermont Care Partners today. Um, I'm a licensed social worker in the state of Vermont. Um, and I oversee all adult programs at HCRS. So we cover Windsor and Wyndham County, which includes outpatient mental health, CRT, a residential, um, residential continuum, which includes therapeutic community residences and um, the crisis team. I come to this conversation with a deep, deep, deep understanding of the gaps in the system of care um, serving Vermonters with um, mental health needs. And I um, also have made a commitment over the last year and a half as a provider to really listen to people who are most impacted by the system that I work in. Um, and upon hearing about the expansion of this secure residential program and the inclusion of involuntary procedures, what I heard loudest was, please don't do that. And so I stopped and listened. Um, and of course now my dogs are gonna bark, so I apologize. Um, and much of my testimony was about involuntary procedures and how they just simply don't belong in a therapeutic community residence, a residence that is designed to achieve wellness and recovery does not and should not include forced medications, restraint, and seclusion. It is detrimental to the healing of people and it is harmful. So I am thankful to hear that the Department of Mental Health has also listened to those Vermonters who have said the same thing and, and rang the alarm saying those two things don't mix. Involuntary procedures, if they belong anywhere, belong in a hospital and a hospital only and not a therapeutic community resident. It is not clear to me based on the um, presentation if involuntary medications will still be permitted in this facility. The commissioner uh, spoke to um, no longer having restraint and seclusion, and I believe that includes forced medications, but if not, I want to go on record saying that Vermont Care Partners opposes the use of involuntary procedures at the secure residential and all community-based settings, including forced medications. We think they are harmful and they do not belong at that level of care. Vermont Care Partners also opposes the expansion of the secure residential from seven beds to 16 beds until all existing inpatient beds 
are back online and the impact of the 12 new beds at the Brattleboro Retreat can be assessed. So right now, there are many hospital beds that are just not being, um, are not available to people. So the newly renovated Wyndham Center is, is, is not available to people. We are encouraging that we have a fully functioning full, um, continuum of care with the capacity to meet people's needs before we add more restrictive beds. So we wanna see what those 12 beds at the retreat, how they impact the needs in the system. We want all the beds that we already have to be online so that we can then see how that impacts the system before adding more secure beds. Vermont Care Partners does support the replacement of the residential facility at Middlesex. Um, and after the assessment is done of all of the needs, um, there is a need for expansion then and only then should it be considered. Um, we believe that the resources that would be um, allocated to the expansion should go to least restrictive, less harmful community-based intervention that are cost-effective and are in alignment with the state of with the state of Vermont's stated values. We want adequate funding for the designated agencies. And this is where I can speak most passionately about. Um, the designated agencies serve some of, we serve Vermonters with some of the most acute mental health needs in the state. And we do it often with the most inexperienced staff and a, a turnover of staff that is profound and harmful to people who are receiving services. I am a licensed clinical social worker with a, a high clinical standards. And when I have to turn to an intern and give them their case assignment, and they are some of the most acute Vermonters in my county, it is not a great feeling. And it would be lovely to have inexperienced licensed staff who stay working at the community mental health centers, but they go, they go to work in other places where they can make more money and where they can, um, where the acuity of need is, is lower. And I've had staff look at me and say, this is the population I wanna serve. This is my, this is what I wanna do, but I can't afford it. So they get their license, they get their experience, they get their training, and they go work at the FQHC or they go work at another agency where they can make more money. And I welcome in and orient a new group of interns who I might get for three years to serve the most acute need. And that is, that is not the quality of care that Vermonters deserve. And particularly these individuals who are often disenfranchised across the board, living in poverty, um, having traumatic experiences. So we ask that some of the resources that are, are scheduled to go for this expansion go to uh, funding the designated agency system so we can better serve Vermonters. Um, we also think that there's, there's room for further, um, there's, there's further need within the residential continuum. So looking at less, least restrictive options like crisis stabilization programs, um, peer respite programs, safe and supportive independent housing, uh, group homes, other therapeutic community residences and, in, and uh, intensive residential program, those places where people can truly go and uh, transition into independence. We have a crisis stabilization program at HCRS that has not operated as a crisis, stab crisis stabilization program for, for, for a few years now because as, as uh, 
you all know about the, the log jam of people within the hospital setting. We have a log jam of people within the crisis stabilization setting, and there's no safe and supportive housing for people to go to. There's, there isn't a place for people to go. So that's an area of opportunity that might, um, you know, an investment in the community, an investment in prevention, if you will, is what will keep people out of the hospital. It's what will keep people out of the secure residential facility. So until we have a full and robust community system of care, then I think we should pause on the expansion of a secure facility. We should focus our attention on those cost-effective, less harmful, least restrictive interventions that we think will help uh, Vermonters to achieve wellness. Um, I also think that we should invest in community education to increase supports for people and tolerance and acceptance of people who are in distress that will reduce stigma and discrimination and the harmful effects of hospitalization and um, uh, secure institutions. Um, and I think, you know, if after all of that, if after we have assessed We've gotten our hospital system up and running and we've assessed our need. We've invested in community interventions. If after all of that, we need an expansion in, in secure residential to meet the needs of Vermonters, then, then we will we'll support it. But not until we look at all options and offer an array of supports. I also know that this committee has, um, I, you mentioned getting letters and hearing from people. Um, it has been life changing to me to spend time listening to people who are impacted by the mental health system, people who have been psychiatrically labeled, people who have been um, harmed by the system. And I encourage you to, to weight their voices, to listen carefully to what they're saying and what might be helpful and invest there too because those creative strategies that have, have been untried in the traditional, traditional system of care could truly be the solution to Vermonters achieving wellness and living um, a life free from distress or at least a life where distress is tolerated and accepted. So, um, I don't think I need to repeat myself, but I will. We oppose uh, the use of involuntary procedures. I do hope that involuntary medications are off the table. I, I hope we can get clarity on that, that involuntary medications are off the table. Um, we expose the, we, excuse me, oppose the expansion of the secure residential until we truly know the impact of bringing all of our hospital beds back online and the expansion at the Brattleboro Retreat, and that we invest in least, we take the savings and we invest in least restrictive community interventions that we think will prevent the need for a secure residential um, and hospitalization and will better serve um, our residents. Thank you so much for giving me the time to speak. Please excuse my nervousness, that was a little shaky, but I appreciate the time greatly. Uh I really appreciate your uh, joining us today and you did great. Uh, I think you've been clear. Uh, and I wanna just be clear so that again, it's my understanding that you're speaking not just for yourself, but for Vermont Care Partners. Is that, I wanna make sure that is understood. That is correct. I'm speaking for Vermont Care Partners, which is all of the designated agencies and specialized service agencies in Vermont. Vermont Care Partners collectively um, opposes the expansion, opposes involuntary procedures, and supports the investment in um, community intervention. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, turn to Ward, and Ward, you help me with the correct pronunciation of your full name. I know yeah, that you've been here yeah, before, I, and I'm just failing. My memory's failing on the correct pronunciation. It's uh, my my name is Ward Nile. Thank you, Ward. Great, and um, I live in South Burlington, 
and I'm speaking as a, as an individual here. Um, but you know, I've been involved with very various aspects of the mental health system and advocacy since uh, March of 2016. Uh, right now, I'm a member. I'm a board member for NAMI Vermont, and I'm a member of both the departmental Department of Mental Health Children and Adult Program Standing Committees. Um, so over the last several years, I can just give you a rundown of my story. Uh, the first year basically involved in uh, law enforcement and mental health issues within Burlington, Vermont, which was interesting. Year two was really an involvement in the Act 82 legislative work groups around emergency department wait times and reducing that. Uh, year three got me involved with a group that was investigating and proposing the use of analytical tools to understand the flow of people through our system. That was an that's an interesting idea there. Um, year four for me got me into hospitals, uh, inpatient and emergency department facility designs a lot of activity there. And I also spent time doing pet therapy once a week within um, the University of Vermont Medical Center, SHEP 3 and SHEP 6. So that was good. Then came year five, and all of us know that was the pandemic. And um, my focus there happened, really happened to be childhood trauma and the impact that and how that gets people into uh, the criminal justice system and into jail. Um, so, and across all of that time, I learned and was involved in uh, what I would call as alternatives to what our normal mental health system is. And I think we, you refer to that a lot of times as peer support, that's kind of a true, but it's, I think Kate was getting at, it's a little bit broader than that. There's a lot more to it than just calling it peer support. Um, but the two points that I wanted to talk about really was to um, support the investment in our community resources and also to oppose the, the seclusion restraints. So I'm happy that um, that's off the table. I'll still talk a little bit about that. Um, so my real point here with community-based services and what I'm seeing is that it always seems like we have this, I hear you, um, community resources are important, but first we need to do something else. And, you know, I've, been, it, I've only been involved here for a a few years before that, I was in aerospace engineer doing complex systems. So I'm a little bit of a, I consider myself an invasive species into this. I'm a come about it from a different point of view, but everything, it, it's always hearing this, but first we need to do something else. And, you know, now we're look, we've talked about a lot of pieces here. I mean, you've got the new, beds that are coming online at Brattleboro level one. And uh, that's intended to, in, you know, adjust and, and improve the emergency department wait times. We're spending a lot of money there. They're not online yet. We don't know what's gonna happen, but we've still committed a lot of funds there. We, I've talked and we're deciding to do you may not be aware of this in the complete committee, but there's been a lot of effort to add beds at the Central Vermont Medical Center. And there, there really is plan was to add eight level one beds there. You know, we spent a lot of money in looking on that. The beds are online. We still have an ED problem. You're hearing about it. Uh, again, you know, we're considering adding beds at the secure residential. We're spending a lot of money here. The beds aren't online. We're making plans to add, and as I see it, 12 beds at Brattleboro, nine new secure residential, 
and eight more beds, all really similar level one high acuity beds, 29 total beds. And, you know, we're not even sure, I think as Kate says, what the impact of the beds that we're putting online are, you know, is, are these 12 beds that we're adding in Brattleboro enough? Do we have to keep adding beds? So it's this, but first we need to add beds before we do our invest in the in the in their community resources and then so is this really the right solution and and i'm going to put back and just you know mention that disability rights vermont has did a study on that and put out a report called wrongly confined and that explains how vermonters are being held in a more restrictive environment because there isn't a place for them to move to and I think it's important because I think in past testimony, the Department of Mental Health has already kind of testified and, and confirmed that we have this problem with lower level community resources causing barrier days and causing people to be stuck at a higher level of care than need be. That represents, you know, a, a possible Olmstead violation so it's there's and I think we need to address it it's it's complex so you know adding resources is this really gonna solve these problems of 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 ed wait times I think the system's really complex and to be able to say it really is it's it's a that's a difficult answer um what we do know is when we increase this capacity, we're going to have the capacity, more capacity to wrongly confine people. So, you know, I'm really hoping that we can address this, change the butt first to get thing to first, let's go to address the community resources. So there really is either a place for people to get served so they don't need to go to the emergency department and then get sequenced into higher level care, or at least be able to get out. Um, I want to, I, you know, the next point I was making is really, a, you know, that is against the secure seclusion restraints at the secure residential. And I'm glad to hear that that's in a sense off the table. And I'm actually, you know, happy that, you know, Kevin Hookshorn and, and her associate are here because I did want to encourage that the Department of Mental Health stick with the six score strategies because I, from what I understand, you don't really need to do emergency involuntary procedures to benefit by the process that six score strategies has. It's about reducing and eliminating the situations and what the environment and the conditions are that would cause someone to need an involuntary procedure. So I think we need to, you know, stick with that. It's really good. Um, one of the reasons that initially that um, the Department of Mental Health was indicating they might need to do emergency involuntary procedures was this cycling people back to from secure residential to a higher level of care, let's say an inpatient where the, you need to go through a, a, an experience through an emergency department, which is pretty bad. Um, what I'm saying is let's think about alternatives to that path through an emergency department. If you're really needing to move somebody back up to a higher level of care, why do we need to go through the emergency department? people are being admitted to inpatient psychiatry without going through an emergency department. I'm not saying that's happening a lot, but it's possible we ought to think about it. So I, again, I'm, you know, I appreciate the chance to, to talk to you all. If you have questions, I'll be here. And uh, I'll move to Malika and uh, Kareem. Thank you, Ward. I appreciate you taking the time and sharing your thoughtful experiences with us. I think we are going to hold questions till we've heard from the witnesses first. 
Uh, and I will turn to Malaika, who uh, uh, is with us and has come on video. Thank you, Malaika. Uh, welcome to the House Healthcare Committee. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to you to share your thoughts and uh, perspective with our committee. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and making the time. Also, thank you so much for uh, making time tomorrow to hear testimony from other people. Um, reduces a bit of the pressure on me in this short amount of time. Uh, so uh, yeah, my name is Malaika Puffer. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a resident of Wyndham County. I'm a manager and a leader at a designated agency, HCRS. Um, I'm also a former patient in the Vermont public mental health system that you all help oversee. I'm a former CRT client. I've experienced um, hospitalization with and without my consent. Um, I've experienced residential step down, down programs and hospital diversion programs. And um, I've experienced seclusion and forced drugging. I'm also a act, very active and involved member of the, state, of the adult state program standing committee which advises the Department of Mental Health. Um, and uh, I'm an advocate uh, on a systems level and also with individuals. So I've spent a good amount of time with folks who are in the emergency department and in the hospital. Um, and uh, I know people who I consider my peers who have been uh, residents at the current Middlesex facility. So that's sort of the experience and knowledge that I'm coming to you with on this issue. Um, I, I appreciate, um, uh, uh, there's a couple of things I just wanna note right off the bat that I agree with DMH about. That is that, of course, as we, as we all know, the current Middlesex facility can't continue to be used. Um, and we do need to look towards phasing down our IMDs, our large hospitals with more than uh, 16 uh, beds. Uh, and appreciate the, the choice to eliminate restraint and seclusion. I'm going to assume that that includes uh, forced drugging. Of course, um, we need clarification of that. Um, I feel like that is one right choice that's been made so far. And I think there are some more right choices yet to be made by DMH on this issue and you all. Um, a couple process points. I did not, I was not informed by the department um, that they were changing their plan so substantially. I was part of a stakeholder meeting on Thursday and the adult standing committee meeting yesterday um, and was not told that. So coming to this a little blindsided and just want to request that the DMH or the committee somehow inform the people who are planning to testify tomorrow about the significant change so that they can speak to the, the, the updated plan. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a few things, uh, concerns I have still, of course the restraint seclusion and forced drugging was a big concern, but I, I like others who have spoken before me do also oppose the expansion of this facility and very much question the need for uh, locked doors and fenced in yards. I, I know from my own experience that uh, of, of course, restraint and seclusion is very traumatic, but so is confinement. Um, I, I saw the pictures that Morning Fox shared of the facility, and I had a visceral sort of trauma reaction to the to the the way the space looked because it looks just like a ton of hospitals that I've been in. Uh, so, if I imagine myself there, I do not see or imagine what um, Dr. Huckshorn and Dr. Labelle imagine as a trauma informed space. You can't lock people in a cage and then call it trauma-informed. Uh, trauma is fundamentally about a loss of power and control. Um, and so locking people in a space is, is a way of taking away their, their autonomy. Um, I appreciate uh, several questions that were asked. Um, and I, I, I guess because there's not a lot of time, I want to prioritize those and speaking to those. Um, one question that Representative Burroughs asked, which was a great question, which is about what alternatives have been considered to serve the population who are currently being served at Middlesex. Um, my, my take is that they're not, there have not really been um, alternatives seriously considered. As a very engaged and involved advocate, I have not been invited to or privy to any conversations 
considering alternatives. Um, Morning Fox did uh, mention um, the uh, sort of uh, outlier enhanced funding programs like MyPad um, and uh, sort of individual staffed models. Um, and uh, you know that, that there's a big delay in getting into those programs. Uh, that is a problem that can be solved. Uh, that is a potentially a route to serve people in the community in a way that is actually trauma informed and conducive to real healing um, uh, by, by expanding that capacity by investing in housing and, and supported housing. Um, and also it, it's of note to me that um, in a 2019 report to the legislature, uh, one of the things that DMH mentioned regarding the secure facility, I'm just gonna look up the language right now, is that uh, in the future, the population that are currently being served by MyPad and those other sort of outlier funding programs might be served in the phys physically secure residence. This to me is, is very, I don't know if that's still the plan because the plan is like constantly moving and there's frequent contradictory information. But if, if there are people who can be served in the community, it is a violation of Olmsted to support them instead in a locked environment. That's the, that's the concept of least restrictive. And I concur with Ward and uh, DRVT that people in Vermont are regularly supported in more restrictive and in more coercive settings than is necessary because of the department's choice and the state's choice to continue to invest in locked settings and in inpatient settings and coercive settings as a higher priority than investing in the community. Uh, there was also a question from Representative Black, which, which I thought was a great question about what percentage of residents in Middlesex currently end up going back to level one beds and is there sort of a revolving door there? Um, I do have that data at hand, um, and, but I don't know how to interpret that data because how do you decide what is an acceptable readmission rate? I did a public records request some time ago with the department for the same data from other residential programs, from Second Spring, Meadowview, Hilltop, Soteria, those, those other unlocked places, and that was never um, supplied. So I don't know if that data doesn't exist or if the department uh, hasn't been willing to share it, uh, but it's a good question. Um, and the, this average of like, um, the range is zero to four times per year. The average-ish, I would estimate just looking at it of about two, uh, times for you that people go back to the hospital. That was one of the rationales from DMH for the need to um, use EIPs uh, in voluntary emergency procedures in the new facility because uh, what they were saying as of last week <laughs> was that it isn't working to not have EIPs there and they have to call the police and that, that people are going back to the hospital too often. I don't see that represented by the data, but I'm, I'm very confused about sort of the rationale for the different decisions. And there certainly is not data really to back, to back up the, the expansion of this program and certainly not the use of EIPs. So I'm, I'm glad at least that has, has changed. I also feel like it's super important to speak to the issue of ED wait times. That DMH has consistently um, claimed that that's part of why we need this facility to uh, address the, the length of time that people are waiting in the emergency department. I do not agree at all that this facility will reduce ED wait times or that expansion of inpatient generally is the solution to ED wait times. I know from my own experience and from supporting so many people in the emergency department, I would wager that I might be the, the person in this virtual room with the most time spent actually with individuals in the emergency department. And I know that so many of us end up there because we don't have another place to go. When I first moved to the area I live in now, I didn't have an established community. I didn't have people who I felt like I could safely call on to support me when I was in 
big emotional distress. And so I called the crisis line. And what I was told was, if you want to connect, if you want to talk to us, we're, we don't have time to talk to you on the phone. If you want to talk to us, you need to go to the emergency department and be screened. And I, so there's, I think there's this idea that people who are in the emergency department must necessarily need to be there. And they must necessarily, people who are admitted to the hospital must necessarily need to be in a locked setting. And people who are on orders of non-hospitalization and involuntary status must necessarily be dangerous. But in reality, so many of us are simply experiencing unmet needs in the community, unmet basic needs like housing, which you can simply get by saying that you want to kill yourself. And then you're in a, on a hospital and you're counted uh, by the system as someone in need of hospitalization when really what you're in need of is housing. And some of us end up there because what we need is simply human connection and someone to be with. So I, I, I would love to see DMH prioritize instead of this uh, project uh, to invest in community solutions. I'd like to read something from their, uh, uh, their uh, vision, the, the uh, 10 year vision, if I can find it easily, which I might not be able to. Uh, I, I, oh, no, I don't have it here. But basically in the 10 year vision, one of the things that DMH identifies as a short term action is to create places for people to go in the community instead of the emergency department like a living room model. There are many different models of what that could look like, but a 24 seven community crisis center, essentially, that is what would reduce wait times and backlogs in the emergency department. And that would be uh, acting in good faith with the Olmstead mandate of least restrictive level of care. And I think uh, this, Projects should be totally scrapped. We should go back to the drawing board and think about what are the needs of the, uh, the people who are currently at Middlesex rather than saying, well, we think what we've done so far is probably good enough because we, we feel like it, uh, not because it's based on any actual standard or measurable data um, and, and, and bring together different community partners and stakeholders to to come up with a solution that best meets people's need with the least amount of harm, with the least cost to taxpayers, and at the least restrictive and coercive level of care. Happy to hear any questions if people have them. Thank you. Thank you, Malika. Uh, appreciate your articulating your concerns to our committee. Uh, again, I, I think it's my intent right now is to hear hear the other witnesses and then hold questions in order to hear from other witnesses. I think at this point, uh, again, thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to Kareem, uh, who I'm searching. Oh, there, hi, Kareem. Uh, you're on our screen. Uh, welcome back to the House Healthcare Committee. Uh, we appreciated hearing from you previously. Um, and in the interest of time, we're going to turn the committee attention over to you. And again, okay. if you introduce yourself for those who may not know, but certainly our committee members remember you and uh, hopefully others as well. Right. Nice seeing everybody again. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kareem Chapman. I am the executive director for Vermont Psychiatric Survivors and a member of PWDI Steering Committee. Um, and thank you for this opportunity to share. You know, I come to you as not only an ED, but also a survivor as well. Okay, I just want to start with that. So it should not hurt to help. I'll repeat, it should not hurt to help. And the hurting part is when the community-based organizations like myself, we struggle to support people due to lack of funding, due to trying to figure out how do we expand our program to support and make it to where people don't have to or need to go to the emergency room. 
There are people every day trying to figure out, I mean, families, individuals are trying to figure out how to support themselves, their family members during this time. And, and I gotta say, we have to get this right. We have to get this right. We, the responsibility is so heavy that if we don't get it right, that window of opportunity that we have right now to get it right will pass us. We'll be right back at the drum board. VPS, you know, we, we are very, it's, it's so good to hear that there won't be any restraints, seclusion rooms, and hopefully any forced medication happening at this, this uh, new facility. Ideally, we don't support it. We don't support the expansion because we, we really don't understand why. Um, there are other beds throughout the state that have not been filled, and we wonder why that hasn't happened. Uh, we wonder why that we've been brought to the table so late in the game as far as uh, input, you know, our perspectives. And, you know, I've been a part of many meetings um, with different folks, and the consensus is that everybody wants to figure it out, right? Everybody wants to get it right. But it's this tension of who is going to do it right. I believe that, that everybody plays a role here. I think the clinical people play a role. I believe the peer support, the survivors, the advocates, we all play a role. And I will repeat, if we don't get it right, people are going to suffer. That's what's at risk right now, that people who are revolving through these doors not being supported adequately. Now, the evidence, the evidence is there that peer support works. It's been proven throughout the world that when you, when you support these community-based organizations like VPS, that it lessens the fact that people will need to go into a hospital setting. And me, myself, working at a designated agency before VPS, I can tell you firsthand that out of all the people I worked with, maybe only one or two went back to the ER. And that was due to the intimacy, me sitting on the couch, me taking walks in the park, me being there during, during good days and during bad days. So I will repeat, we need to get this right. I would rather see the money go to, you know, even before I go there, I definitely understand the, um, the importance of renovating this old Middlesex facility. It's no place I would want to be or have my family member want to be. So that, that responsibility is on us to get that part right as well. So again, the tension really from, from our perspective, the Sykes virus is that we weren't brought to the initial conversation and now we're here trying to figure it out and now we, we're being heard. Um, again, you know, I, it is so good to hear that it won't be in the uh, restraints or seclusion rooms and enforced medication. Um, that 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 is that is part of the battle. That that is part of uh, of the fight, right? Um, but just to reflect, you know, what, what Malika said earlier, you know, we can't come across at, at with a band aid approach, like we'll, we'll we'll do this now and maybe it'll it'll be later. We need more concrete evidence of what can actually work, right? And we know what works for sure is community-based organizations, them being funded properly to be able to support and help people. So um, I'm gonna leave it at that because it's late and I gotta pick up my kiddos. Um, but, you know, again, I can't stress enough the importance of getting this right. It should not, hurt to help. And, and when we're at the, the level of community work, it hurts to not be able to help people in the right way. It hurts to not be able to tell someone that we're working with that we can't help house you. We, or, or we can't do this for you because our resources are limited to that effort. So again, if there's any questions, I don't, I don't mind uh, uh, at, uh, answering, um, but I hope this was short and to the point and you kind of kind of got an understanding of where I'm coming from, and, and I hope that was helpful. Thank you, thank you, I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, your kiddos need you as well. So thank you for making time for us as well as for them. Uh, 
So I'm going to just at this point, uh, because I did it, uh, even though we have a little bit of time left, uh, I think I'd rather open it up for questions and I'd ask Devin Green if she would reschedule with us and she I think agreed to do that. So are there questions from uh, committee members for uh, members of the for the witnesses? And uh, there's certainly uh, and well, let's let's hear from committee members. There's certainly the outstanding question, which I'll just name, which is uh, is involuntary medication. Uh, and maybe I'll ask the commissioner to comment on that, if you don't mind, before we hear the other questions, because I think that's been an outstanding question that people have had. And so let's ask the commissioner or deputy commissioner to comment on that. When you said that, uh, uh, yeah, this is Commissioner Squirrel. I'm I'm happy to speak to that. Um, it was actually never part of what we were initially proposing. So there will be no involuntary medications. Thank you. I think it's important to have that clarified. It was clearly on the minds of many of our witnesses today. And it'll be important to have that clarified for potential witnesses tomorrow afternoon as well. So thank you, Commissioner, for, for making that clear. Uh, I'll turn then to, uh, I think, I think Representative Cordes, you may have been the first with the hand up and then Representative Goldman. Thank you everyone for your deep and compelling testimony. My question um, has both short-term and long-term answers. The long-term answers we don't have time for, but um, I'd appreciate further um, opportunity as a committee to hear those answers either in written testimony submitted to our committee assistant <clears throat> or if we have another opportunity um, to have you testify in front of the committee again. And the, the question that I hope you can provide very short um, answers to, and this would be um, any one or two of you that um, feel like you have answers. We have talked a little bit, but not very extensively about um, children with um, children in crisis, children with um, psychiatric needs um, that may need to be met on an inpatient basis. And I know that we have, as a state, um, have been lacking in the capacity to um, care for those individuals. So my question is, um, in your capacity, um, and I would say, I'm going to ask the people that um, work with and provide community services this: where are the where are our gaps um, in in uh, providing services for our pediatric populations? Is there anyone who wants to well, uh, comment? Okay, on that? I'll let I'll Sorry. let Kate go. Kate, no, Kate. Kate, and then, okay. Yeah, appreciate it. Um, I am the adult services director, and although I think I could give you a lot of information on uh, the, what I think are the gaps, I think I would ask um, somebody from Vermont Care Partners to provide written written testimony for you to be sure that we get the voices of um, the children's directors, if that's okay. Thanks. Any Anyone else who is here wishing to comment on that? To Representative Cordes' question, at least comment today and perhaps with further testimony later. Okay, I think I think at this point we'll turn to Representative Goldman. Thank you, and yes, thank you everybody for your testimony today. Um, Kate Lamphere raised sort of a, bunch, a sort of a series of questions for me, and. I just want to throw them out. They're really for the commissioner um, and the assistant commissioner because uh, of her, her, her testimony raised some uh, curiosity in me. So if I could just throw them out and I don't know that you want to answer them now, but she raised the question of how many beds are not online. And I'm curious about that number and why they might not be online. It was a workforce is issue and, and those kinds of things. She also raised the question of how does the new beds of the Brattleboro Retreat fit in? And I'm very interested in that um, in terms of reducing ER bottlenecks and those kinds of things, um, and also how they fit into the levels of care. Um, the other curiosity that came up for me was I think I heard you say that Middlesex staffing was like 70 if the new facility was built. 
And I'm just wondering if there's a workforce for that, because we also know, and I also think Kate mentioned some of the problems with workforce there. Um, so those are the kinds of questions that I'm wondering about, particularly at this moment, the Brattleboro retreat beds and how it fits into the whole system. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to speak to that. I think in previous testimony, I have addressed the closed beds that we have in the system as a result of the COVID pandemic. Um, that is a national issue. You know, if you um, look across the country, um, due to the impact of COVID and workforce challenges, um, there are many closed beds in the system of care. Um, so I'm happy to um, provide more information about that, um, but that is certainly something that we are seeing and experiencing. And of course, even on the community side, um, we have seen decreased capacity um, due to workforce challenges um, and the ongoing impact of the pandemic. So that's, you know, statewide and hopefully as we continue to move towards recovery as a state, uh, we have more um, vaccine deployment that our workforce will recover our you know, capacity will come back online um, as we certainly pre-pandemic um, were also experiencing um, long wait times um, for emergency departments. Um, the 12 new level one beds were something that the legislature um, supported um, to advance in terms of meeting the needs of the system of care, um, that there was um, continued need and demonstrated need um, for these higher acuity beds um, to support individuals um, and moving them out of emergency departments. So that decision was made years ago um, to move that investment forward. Um, I think it was also uh, part of that thoughtful discussion was you know, as we advance our system, as we realize um, some of the impacts of overall integration and support of the community, um, that maybe, you know, down the road, we won't need as many inpatient beds and perhaps um, those beds could be repurposed um, for other uses. Uh, we also, in response to the pandemic, um, converted a 10 bed unit at the Wyndham Center um, to a COVID positive unit. Um, again, I felt like it was my responsibility to ensure that we had capacity um, for individuals um, who might be experiencing a psychiatric crisis and who were also COVID positive. Um, we were also able to utilize funding to actually upgrade the facility so that they could accept a higher level of care due to some of the lacking in the environment of care, um, the Wyndham Center actually was not able to accept involuntary patients um, prior to the upgrades that we made. So it was only serving voluntary individuals. Um, so as we continue to assess the conditions on the ground, um, then um, those, uh, the 10 bed unit at the Wyndham Center um, would be coming back online as a general adult unit, and then um, the 12 new level one beds, the Brattleboro Retreat, would also be coming back online. Um, and the only thing I would just note is that, um, you know, we and I think Vermont Care Partners and others have articulated what we are going to see is increased demand in our mental health system across all levels of care as a result of the pandemic. And that pre-COVID, even with all of our bed capacity online, we were experiencing long wait times in emergency departments. So yes, the 12 level one beds will serve to help address that need, to alleviate some of the pressure on the EDs, particularly in the areas that we need it most, um, which is access to these high acuity beds. So I, I just wanna note that even when all of our beds were online, um, we were seeing increased wait times. Um, so that's just something for us all to take in consideration. And then when you layer on top, what we would see is possibly increased demand. Um, that is something we wanna ensure that we are well prepared for as a system of care. Um, the other note, um, I guess, that I would make is that as we've articulated, um, the step-down capacity at the secure residential is a different level of care than hospital level of care. And so as individuals are able to appropriately access um, that level one care as they need it, 
it is incredibly important that we have capacity to step them down to um, so that, you know, we know that the individuals, the data that we have related to um, individuals who have benefited um, from the secure residential, that they have these enormous length of stays um, in our inpatient facilities. Um, so it would seem wise, prudent, strategic, and in the best interest of the system um, that we also ensure that we have that adequate step-down capacity in addition to all of the community supports that we need to continue to pay attention to. So um, I guess those are a, a few questions and then I might have missed one, but I think your final one was workforce. Um, and as I mentioned, I think our, our staffing needs will shift based on um, some of the changes that we're proposing for the program. So I do wanna follow up with the committee in terms of what that looks like. Um, you know, and I, I, I don't wanna minimize what we see as workforce challenges across the system of care, um, but would hope that we are able to recruit um, individuals um, to work in the secure recovery residence. Um, we were trying to be somewhat thoughtful about um, it being um, in an area where possibly workforce recruitment um, would possibly be enhanced um, given its proximity to Chittenden County. And I think I'll leave it at that. So can I just follow up for a minute because I was trying to do an inventory in my own mind about closed beds. And you mentioned the Wyndham Center, which is 10 beds, which is actually available for COVID, um, COVID related, uh, um, COVID involved patients. Um, which I think has not had to be used particularly. Is that correct? It's a, that's it, it has been used um, for COVID positive psychiatric patients. But at a minimal level, is that right? In terms of numbers? Yes, I think the numbers, it's that kind of a- good news, actually. I'm not, there's not a criticism. It's just to understand. Yeah, what it's it's a, a low frequency, high intensity event, of course. But yes, um, the numbers have been small. Yes. And so then, and then there's a 12 beds coming on at Brattleboro, as you mentioned. Are there, are there other beds, however, at Brattleboro that have been closed as, as those beds are in line to come open? Are, are there other beds in Brattleboro Retreat that have actually been closed due to workforce or other issues so that the, so the net gain at the Brattleboro Retreat is actually not a net gain of 12 beds? Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, so... Yes, the Brattleboro Retreat, as we all know, um, even pre-COVID was on somewhat shaky fiscal ground. Um, and the capacity to that system of care, um, of course, um, is essential in terms of timely access to care, given the volume of individuals that it serves. Um, so as a result of COVID um, and impacts to the overall workforce, um, they have taken um, one full unit offline um, and they have closed beds on their system, just as we do in other areas of the system of care. We have closed beds at the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital um, simp <laughs> simply because of workforce challenges. Um, so I just, across the board, I think that's something that we're all grappling with as inpatient partners. Um, so the intent is um, to fully reopen capacity at the Brattleboro Retreat, um, I do not have a crystal ball um, to determine, you know, how workforce, how quickly will that recalibrate, how quickly the retreat will be able to um, staff up in that regard. So I think that is something we'll have to continue to monitor. Um, and then we have, you know, within the workforce, there are very specific uh, pinch points for all of us. One of them is nursing shortages. Um, and doctors, psychiatrist shortages. <clears throat> so I think that's a real reality for us as a system of care and something we also need to take into consideration as we go forward. So just, just to try, try to put a fine point on just so I understand the capacity uh, in terms of the number of additional beds that have been closed at the Brattleboro Retreat due to workforce or other issues, can, is there a number that you have? Is that when you say a, whole, a unit has been closed, is that how many beds is that? Yes, I think the rich, I think in total right now, as of today, we overall have 53 beds closed in the system. Um, and that includes the psychiatric care hospital. It does. And other, you know, closed beds in other inpatient units. Um, I would, I think the retreat might be closer to 35 of those, but I need to follow up. They also have some closed beds on their child and youth unit as well. Right. So, so I think it, it leaves the question, certainly for me, just trying to do the, 
the numbers that the system has potentially 53 beds that can reopen in terms of added capacity if workforce or COVID or other issues get resolved. Is that, is that, a, fair, is that a fair statement? It would be reopening back to our original capacity, yes. Right. So, but, but nevertheless, right now there's 53 beds that are closed. So 53 beds reopening actually brings us back to the same level of capacity without the 12 beds at the Brattleboro, without, without the additional 12 beds. So we actually have 53 plus 12, 65 beds, more capacity that are not currently available. Yes, and I guess the only point I was make was that even when we had all of our beds open, um, we were still experiencing long wait times to access inpatient care. I mean, I, yes, I appreciate. I, I do appreciate that. I just, yeah. it's, it's just hard to keep the numbers clear in terms of what where we are in terms of added capacity, and so then the additional capacity would also be the additional beds at the Middlesex or the new the replacement facility for Middlesex would be. Uh, the additional beds, if I wasn't tired, I'd do the math real quickly. Uh, so that, that would actually add capacity, but at that level of care, which is a different level of care, as you pointed out, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, we're, we're fast approaching the end of our time here uh, for the afternoon. Uh, so I'm going to just really quickly turn to Representative Peterson, Representative Page, perhaps you could name your questions. And then, as I said, we're going to need to come back and have more opportunities with the commissioner and others. Representative Peterson and Representative Page. Yeah, yes, thank, thank you, Chair Lippert. Um, I, I now don't know if I should pose this question. I, I, your discussion just now with the extra beds kind of tilted me off in, in, into space, but at the end, you said that the, I, and I assume uh, uh, Commissioner Squirrel would verify that the any of those beds have nothing to do with the seven beds at Middlesex, correct? They, they, they don't translate because there's a different level of care at, at Middlesex right now. Is that not correct? Commissioner, you want to respond to that? Sure. It, I think Representative Peterson, that's a really good point and something that we need to continue to keep in mind um, that when we're talking about inpatient most restrictive level of care, most expensive level of care, it is different than step down capacity. Okay. And so that leads me to my real question. To me, you know, you, you, these folks got flooded out. We, we put two trailers together, how many years ago now? Nine. And they've been living in that facility for nine years. It would seem to me that it's logical what you're what you're trying to do. Um, build a, a facility that's new and modern. And, and my question was to the other folks here uh, who gave great testimony um, this afternoon, given the fact we need to do something with the folks in that facility, it, the time has come, I think, to do something different than what we're doing. What have you got as a proposal that is something to, to say you're against the plan is fine, but let's assume that we have to do something. What's your proposal? May I respond very briefly? Please, please do. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think it's a bigger question than we can answer right now, but a few ideas that come to mind are using more of those enhanced individual funding plans, the individualized programs like MyPad, great solution. Uh, moving folks who are currently in Middlesex, moving the program, keeping the program as it is into the VPCH facility as happened this past year. Clearly there's the space. Um, okay. Or creating more intensive residential capacity that is staff secure. Just a few options that come to mind. There are more, I'm sure as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Representative Page, and then we're gonna finish for the afternoon. Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, and this would be for um, Commissioner Squirrel. Regarding Middlesex, we all know we need to do something there. But with some of the recommendations that have been presented today uh, from our, our witnesses and such, is there still an opportunity to make necessary changes to perhaps 
know, turn the ship around and make these necessary changes or these recommendations that have, that have come uh, before us. And I don't have, I can't give you what those changes would be, but is there still time to, you know, to, ch to change what we all, what, what you presented to us today regarding the new Middlesex at the old Woodside facility? So I, I think I caught most of that representative page. It was a little bit faint. Um, as the commissioner of the Department of Mental Health, who is responsible for the care and custody of individuals across the state of Vermont, I have presented to you what I think is in the best interest of Vermonters, what I think will help us transition those individuals who have the highest level of need safely to a step-down program which will support their ongoing success in the community. We have seen increases in acuity of need. We have seen these individuals and this cohort of individuals occupying incredible lengths of stay in our inpatient beds. It makes sense that we expand the current footprint of the facility to create the step-down capacity that will then lend itself for success for these individuals in the long run. I think I would invite you to also go back to reflect on Dr. Richard's vignettes and the individuals and the acuity of need that we are talking about. Um, it is always the department's priority to serve individuals in the community. We also need to recognize when due to their own safety and the safety of the community that some individuals will benefit from a step down level of care that can provide that ongoing treatment and support. Um, so that's the key. We need capacity in the system for all levels of need. Um, and that is the proposal that we have presented. Again, we have continued to listen um, to our valued advocate partners. You know, I, as someone who also has a family member who has been served by the system of care, you know, that weighs heavily on me as well. And I am putting in front of you what I think is in the best interest of Vermonters and that will serve the system of care in the long run. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Woody, Representative Page, uh, for uh, voicing that question. Uh, we've gone over slightly, but I think we'll, we'll call it a day here. This is, this is clearly very important uh, deliberations and it, it deserves our attention that we're giving it. I uh, really greatly appreciate Commissioner Squirrel, your willingness to both present and to have modified a proposal that had been put forward previously in response to concerns that have been raised. Uh, thank you to you and uh, Deputy Commissioner Fox. Um, we are going to hear more testimony tomorrow afternoon from others. Uh, I'm hoping that Devin Green will be able to be part of that as well. We received many letters, uh, both opposing the proposal. I think it's now important for those who wish to comment and were concerned about seclusion and restraint and the possibility of involuntary medication for them to recognize that that, I believe it's fair to say, has been taken off the table by the department today during testimony. And so uh, I think the, the, hopefully that will get communicated as so people as they testify tomorrow uh, can take that into consideration and still perhaps comment on it. Um, with that, we're going to adjourn for the day. Uh, thank you all. This is, this is important. It's also challenging as we're doing it on Zoom, but I appreciate everyone's effort in being part of this. Uh, and I think this has been a successful afternoon for us to hear many points of view and for us as a committee to continue our challenging deliberations on this. Uh, this, is a pivot, this is a pivotal decision point. So with that, uh, thank you all. A, a reminder to our committee, we are, we are convening tomorrow morning at 8.30. I have to check in with Colleen, who has been busy scheduling some witnesses for us for tomorrow morning. Still, there's been, there's been, there have been things moving around. Uh, I will be checking in with Colleen as soon as we finish here. Uh, but let's plan to check in at 8.30 tomorrow morning, please. I know that we have one witness who has to be heard before 9 o'clock. And um, so tomorrow, our, we move our attention to House Bill 210 which is the bill around health equity and addressing health disparities. Um, so thank you all and uh